Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be reviewing the Hunger Games trilogy. So this actually passed me by in their original incarnation, and unfortunately I have seen the movies. I say unfortunately, uh, the movies got added to Netflix, so I watched them with my other half, because she's a fan of both the books and the movies. And because I enjoyed the movies, I figured I would try the books out. I've now read the first book, The Hunger Games, and I'm going to review that, and then I'm going to try and pick up the next two books as well, and kind of combine this into one big old video. But first off, I will read the blurb. Winning means fame and fortune. Losing means certain death. The Hunger Games have begun. In the ruins of a place once known as North America lies the nation of Panem, a shining capital surrounded by 12 outlying districts. The capital is harsh and cruel and keeps the districts in line by forcing them all to send one boy and one girl between the ages of 12 and 18 to participate in the annual Hunger Games, a fight to the death on live TV. 16-year-old Katniss Everdeen regards it as a death sentence when she steps forward to take her sister's place in the games. But Katniss has been close to death before, and survival, for her, is second nature. Without really meaning to, she becomes a contender, but if she is to win, she will have to start making choices that weigh survival against humanity and life against love. Okay, so... First thoughts on this, I mean this is kind of an iconic YA novel, and I think The Hunger Games, along with Twilight and Harry Potter, are really what led to the boom i think i think that's why you know writers like cassandra clare and whoever else are so popular now although i don't to be fair i don't know when it's first published 2008 so i don't know when cassandra clare's first book was published now what i will say about this is there's nothing particularly special about the writing it's the plotting and the world building which really stands out here so i almost feel as though any half decent ya writer could have written this book if they'd been given an outline <laughs> and like all of the information about the world, you know? So, you know, that's where I think Suzanne Collins really stands out here, trilogy. So this actually passed me by in their original incarnation, and unfortunately, I have seen the movies. I say unfortunately. Uh, the movies got added to Netflix, so I watched them with my other half, because she's a fan of both the books and the movies. And because I enjoyed the movies, I figured I would try the books out. I've now read the first book, The Hunger Games, and I'm gonna review that, and then I'm gonna try and pick up the next two books as well and kind of combine this into one big old video. But first off, I will read the blurb. Winning means fame and fortune. Losing means certain death. The Hunger Games have begun. In the ruins of a place once known as North America lies the nation of Panem, a shining capital surrounded by 12 outlying districts. The capital is harsh and cruel and keeps the districts in line by forcing them all to send one boy and one girl between the ages of 12 and 18 to participate in the annual Hunger Games, a fight to the death on live TV. 16-year-old Katniss Everdeen regards it as a death sentence when she steps forward to take her sister's place in the games. But Katniss has been close to death before, and survival, for her, is second nature. Without really meaning to, she becomes a contender, but if she is to win, she will have to start making choices that weigh survival against humanity and life against love. Okay, so, first thoughts on this. I mean, this is kind of an iconic YA novel, and I think The Hunger Games, along with Twilight and Harry Potter, are really what led to the boom, I think. I think that's why, you know, writers like Cassandra Clare and whoever else are so popular now. Although I don't, to be fair, I don't know when it's first published. 2008, so I don't know when Cassandra Clare's first book was published. Now, what I will say about this is there's nothing particularly special about the writing. It's the plotting and the world building which really stands out here. So I almost feel as though any half-decent YA writer could have written this book if they'd been given an outline <laughs> and, like, all of the information about the world, you know? So, you know, that's where I think Suzanne Collins really stands out here. One of my problems with this was the, uh, it's written in first person, which has always been a bugbear for me. I can totally see why it makes sense for this novel, though, because you're then learning things along with Katniss. She's also a great protagonist, you know, strong female character, but, uh, in a non-cringy way, you know, she's just a very well-rounded character. And I don't know whether some of the others aren't necessarily as well-rounded. Uh, for example, what's his name? Caesar Flickerman or whatever his name is, the TV host guy. He, he's very much a caricature of a type of person. But uh, other characters in this were great. I really like Haymitch, actually. And I think when you start to understand a bit more of his backstory, 
He becomes a really tragic character, I think, more so than most of the others, even characters like Rue. So yeah, I'm gonna go through and take a look at some of the different uh, flags that I put in as well, try and figure out what it was that I flagged. So we're getting started, obviously Katniss is, is, a, is a hunter, they're living in District 12, it's kind of a poor area, used to be, well it still is, is a coal mining area. And because her and her family can't afford food, she does a lot of hunting. And one of the things it says here is, uh, so um, they make an effort to keep on good terms with Greasy Sai. She's the only one who can consistently be counted on to buy wild dog. We don't hunt them on purpose, but if you're attacked and you take out a dog or two, well, meat is meat. Once it's in the soup, I'll call it beef, Greasy Sai says with a wink. And to me, I mean, I'm vegan, so meat is meat. I, I don't really see the difference between eating different animals, but... Uh, I think I'm the crazy one, societally. There's some extra information here on the reaping system in which they pick who goes to participate in the Hunger Games, which I don't think this was covered in the movie. And it's actually quite a clever system so that as you get older, you're more likely to be picked. So it says here, the reaping system is unfair with the poor getting the worst of it. You become eligible for the reaping the day you turn 12. That year, your name is entered once. At 13, twice, and so on and so on until you reach the age of 18, the final year of eligibility, when your name goes into the pool seven times. That's true for every citizen in all 12 districts in the entire country of Panem. But here's the catch. Say you're poor and starving, as we were. You can opt to add your name more times in exchange for tesserae. Each tessera is worth a meagre year's supply of grain and oil for one person. You may do this for each of your family members as well. So at the age of 12, I had my name entered four times, once because I had to, and three times for tesserae for grain and oil for myself, Prim, and my mother. In fact, every year I have needed to do this. And the entries are cumulative. So now at the age of 16, my name will be in the reaping 20 times. Gail, who is 18 and has been either helping or single-handedly feeding a family of five for seven years, will have his name in 42 times. So it is a bit of an unfair system that punishes the poor, but... I mean, that's quite realistic, isn't it, so... And then Prim, who is Katniss's little sister, she gets called up and Katniss opts to do it. And here uh, it's described, here's the, uh, here's, the, here's the paragraph. Then something unexpected happens. At least, I don't expect it, because I don't think of District 12 as a place that cares about me. But a shift has occurred since I stepped up to take Prim's place, and now it seems I have become someone precious. At first one, then another, then almost every member of the crowd touches the three middle fingers of their left hand to their lips and holds it out to me. It is an old and rarely used gesture of our district, occasionally seen at funerals. It means good. It means thanks. It means admiration. It means goodbye to someone you love. One of the criticisms here, actually, is that the Hunger Games is kind of a a rip off of Battle Royale, and it's not. Not really. Like it's different enough that it stands on its own. I don't think it would without the world building, but the world building is again really what makes this, to be honest. And uh, as Katniss makes her way into the city. Uh, she starts to experience capital life. So, for example, she says, we don't have hot water at home unless we boil it, whereas in the capital they have running water. And then she goes for a shower and she says, I've never had a shower before. It's like being in summer rain, only warmer. We also get more information on what Jabba Jays are, and they're quite important to the storyline, and they are in the movie, but it's not really explained in the movie. So I'm going to read this here. Uh, the common term for them was mutations, or sometimes mutts for short. One was a special bird called a Jabberjay that had the ability to memorise and repeat whole human conversations. They were homing birds, exclusively male, that were released into regions where the capital's enemies were known to be hiding. After the birds gathered words, they'd fly back to centres to be recorded. It took people a while to realise what was going on in the districts, how private conversations were being transmitted. Then, of course, the rebels fed the capital endless lies and the joke was on it. So the centres were shut down and the birds were abandoned to die off in the wild. That was another example, just some of these sentences are a bit clunky and they like jarred me when I was reading them and that was a great example of it there, like reading it aloud, I got it wrong because I'm confused about where the sentence is going. Only they didn't die off. Instead, the Jabber Jays mated with female mockingbirds, creating a whole new species that could replicate both bird whistles and human melodies. They had lost the ability to enunciate words but could still mimic a range of human vocal sounds, from a child's high-pitched warble to a man's deep tones. And they could recreate songs, not just a few notes, but whole songs with multiple verses, if you had the patience to sing them and if they liked your voice. We also get loads of this stuff about Katniss's dad who died in a mining accident. I'm assuming he didn't die in a mining accident, that that's a lie. Maybe that was covered in the movies? Again, I don't know, I sort of stopped listening after a while. Alright, now we are having... Uh... Katniss is having some beauty sessions done to make her look presentable. 
RIP! I grit my teeth as Venia, a woman with aqua hair and gold tattoos above her eyebrows, yanks a strip of fabric from my leg, tearing out the hair beneath it. Sorry, she pipes in her silly capital accent, you're just so hairy. Why do these people speak in such a high pitch? Why do their jaws barely open when they talk? Why do the ends of their sentences go up as if they're asking a question? I mean, to be fair to you, Katniss, that was three questions in a row. It's interesting, though, because you don't often read about, like, waxing and hair removal in in books. And, you know, it's like the old joke that no one ever goes to the toilet in a movie. Here's the thing that I didn't notice, which I assume they did in the movies. Basically, it just says uh, Caesar Flickerman, the host of the games, that he dyes his hair a different colour for each games. And I totally didn't notice that in the movie. He's also incredibly annoying in the movie and hardly in the books at all. Like, such a minor character. Does he play any role? I don't think he impacts the storyline at all. We have just this little sentence here. I'm so nervous I could be eating coal dust. And I think that was just a nice little throwback to, you know, the coal mining sort of district that she comes from. Also, as well, another thing that wasn't kind of mentioned in the movie. So she gets given this gold Mockingjay pin and... Uh, She's almost not allowed to take it into the games because it could be considered to be a weapon. And to be honest, I was expecting it to play some sort of role. It didn't play any role. And then we start the games and uh, the first problem that she has is water, as it would be in a long-term survival thing. And there's even an interview at the end of this with Suzanne Collins where she talks about sort of the research she did and she, she was like, well, what I found was that it's very, very difficult to survive. <laughs> uh, so... She's trying to find water, and here it goes. As the day wears on, I know I'm headed for trouble. What little urine I've been able to pass is a dark brown. My head is aching, and there's a dry patch on my tongue that refuses to moisten. The sun hurts my eyes, so I dig out my sunglasses. But when I put them on, they do something funny to my vision, so I just stuff them back in my pack. I do wonder what the something funny was. Was it just that it... darkened? But I don't know. I don't know. We have this moment as well where there's been a fire and then she has to climb a tree and it says if running hurt, climbing is agonizing because it requires not only exertion but direct contact of my hands on the tree bark and that was making me wince. That would hurt. Burns in general, like one of the worst worst injuries. And then uh, there's this girl called Glimmer and she gets killed by the, what they call tracker jackers, I think. And they're basically like super venomous insect things that... They cause all kinds of havoc, and we have this little paragraph. Uh, this reference to the cannon firing is because there's a, a cannon goes off every time somebody's killed as well. I reach Glimmer just as the cannon fires. The tracker jackers have vanished. This girl, so breathtakingly beautiful in her golden dress the night of the interviews, is unrecognisable. Her features eradicated, her limbs three times their normal size. The stinger lumps have begun to explode, spewing putrid green liquid around her. I have to break several of what used to be her fingers with a stone to free the bow. The sheath of arrows is pinned under her back. I try to roll over her body by pulling on one arm, but the flesh disintegrates in my hands and I fall back onto the ground. And so yeah, this girl is one of the careers, the people who are kind of raised to participate in the Hunger Games, and she's got the bow, and Katniss is like deadly with a bow, but not necessarily great with other stuff. So she's been hankering after this bow all the way, all the way through the combat, and she's finally got her hands on it. And that's really when the tide begins to turn. We also have this point where, so Katniss and Rue are kind of, they kind of, oh hey Kat, Katniss and Rue kind of team up with each other uh, to, to take down the careers and they see they have this like big food pile out in the open and they, they kind of realise it's a trap but at the same time they realise they need to destroy it and Rue says Katniss even if you could get to the food how would you get rid of it and she says burn it, dump it in the lake, soak it in fuel, eat it, don't worry I'll think of something. Destroying things is much easier than making them. Uh, here's a, a little bit more of Rue here. So um, she says, basically she signals uh, quitting time in her district by singing to the mocking jays. It says, uh, there's a special little song I do, says Rue. She opens her mouth and sings a little four note run in a sweet, clear voice. And the mocking jays spread it around the orchard. And uh, they actually obviously like made that as part of the movie they this is really annoying me i'm gonna have to close that door cheers biggie so as part of the movie they had to like make that four note sequence you know out loud i guess because when you read about it in a book it's very different everybody could picture that four note sequence differently and it's kind of like duh, 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 duh. or is that just that's just a ukulele actually that's ukulele tuning i don't know whether that's what the actual thing goes like it does this quite clumsily uh, Rue gets injured and so it says and she asks Katniss to sing and Katniss goes sing my throat is tight with tears hoarse from smoke and fatigue but if this is Prim's I mean Rue's last request 
I have to at least try. I, I don't know, that for me was... It was too heavy-handed, like, showing that she thinks of Rue as her sister, basically. Because we get that already, and just slip having that little slip of the name there, it just felt too contrived for me. I also think this is great, so after Rue dies, uh, she's from District 11, and uh, we get this little bit. So during the games, people can send in, like, the sponsors can send in gifts. Okay, I have a confession to make. I've been away for several days at this point. I've decided what we're going to do here. This is going to be a review of just the first Hunger Games book because this video is going on forever. And then when I get to the later ones, we'll do those as individual videos. Anyway, let's get to the next point. So I think this is a really nice touch after Rue dies and uh, Katniss kind of covers her body in flowers so that when she's taken away, you know, she doesn't look maimed or whatever, doesn't look injured by the spear that killed her. And the people of District 11 who are the district that she's from, kind of show their respect here. So it says, uh, I'm about to haul my packs into a tree to make camp when a silver parachute floats down and lands in front of me. A gift from a sponsor. But why now? I've been in fairly good shape with supplies. Maybe Haymitch has noticed my despondency and is trying to cheer me up a bit. Or could it be something to help my ear? I open the parachute and find a small loaf of bread. It's not the fine white capital stuff. It's made of dark ration grain and shaped in a crescent, sprinkled with seeds. I flash back to Peter's lesson on the various district breads in the training centre. This bread came from District 11. I cautiously lift the still warm loaf. What must it have cost the people of District 11 who can't even feed themselves? How many would have had to do without to scrape up a coin to put in the collection for this one loaf? It had been meant for Rue, surely. But instead of pulling the gift when she died, they'd authorised Haymitch to give it to me. As a thank you. Or because, like me, they don't like to let debts go unpaid. For whatever reason, this is a first. A district gift to a tribute who's not your own. And then she says thanks to District 11. Although, then at a later point, she gets spared by somebody because she tried to help Rue. And my understanding that it was that it was the guy from her district. But in which case, shouldn't they have sent it to him, really? I don't know. I might be wrong that it's the guy from their district. And it is, a, you know, it's a powerful symbolic gesture for sure. Yeah, Thresh. So it says, it says Thresh is still going. So why didn't they send it to Thresh? That's really harsh in that, when you look at it like that. Oh, mind you, I suppose Rue's sponsors were for her and not for the other kid, weren't they? Because it was only really Katniss and Peter who got sponsors together, I guess, because they played their, their love interest thing. And then, of course, you got Katniss being oblivious to the fact that Peter actually has feelings for her. There are, like, repeated bits where he goes, like, you know why? And she's like, I don't. And it's like, Come on, Katniss! You do! Oh, and I like this as well. So, uh, this is where, where Peter says where he first noticed her. And he says, it was at the first day of school. We were five. You had on a red plaid dress and your hair. It was in two braids instead of one. My father pointed you out when we were waiting to line up. Your father? Why? I asked. He said, see that little girl? I wanted to marry her mother, but she ran off with a coal miner. And then Katniss is like, you're making it up. And uh, the reason she ran off with the coal miner with Katniss's dad was because when he sings, even the birds stopped to listen, which was true. I think this is interesting as well because, so I, I feel as though Haymitch is like the most, um, I want to say tortured or like, no, the most tragic character in the Hunger Games in many respects. So, uh, and this kind of hints as to why. So secretly, I'm wondering if Haymitch sobered up long enough to help Peter and me. Peter and I, it should be. Because he thought we just might have the wits to survive. Maybe he wasn't always a drunk. Maybe in the beginning he tried to help the tributes, but then it got unbearable. It must be hell to mentor two kids and then watch them die, year after year after year. I realise that if I get out of here, that will become my job, to mentor the girl from District 12. The idea is so repellent, I thrust it from my mind. Okay, we have these bits. This is the difference between the movie and the book. So in the movie, they just sort of get attacked by these mutant dogs. But in the books, they actually have like the eyes and the characteristics of the uh, the other fallen tributes. And that makes it more haunting, you know. For example, there's one that's Rue. And then there's kind of the question of whether they maintain any of their intelligence or not. And then as well, then those things... Like, they play with, uh, I think his name's Kato, the, the third, like, the third, there's only three of them left, and then he goes down, and, they, like, he's taken away by these dogs, and they don't kill him. <laughs> they just, like, maim him and torture him. And then I think eventually Katniss puts him out of his misery with, like, an arrow to the face. It's, it's pretty brutal. 
There's also this bit right at the end where she goes, I think, uh, I think I just catch a glimpse of pink hair. It must be Effie. It has to be Effie coming to my rescue. And I'm like, well, it, it could be Caesar Flickerman, I think his name is. The TV host guy. He has mental hair too. Speaking of which, he's here. What did I flag here? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know, actually. That's a massive spoiler and it's right at the end. And I don't really need to share that one little bit. But, uh, yeah, that's what I thought of The Hunger Games and some of the little bits throughout the book that kind of stood out to me. I did, like I say, I genuinely, genuinely did enjoy reading this and I'll look forward to reading the rest of the series. In the meantime, I'm giving it a pretty solid 4 out of 5. And, uh, yeah, it was good. You should read it. I'm guessing most people watching this already have, but, yeah. So on that note, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read The Hunger Games and if so, what you thought about it. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.